Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Multicoin Summit. Thank you all for being here, uh, here in New York City. Let's rock and roll. Last year, we gave a presentation uh, around composability. And in that presentation, we discussed, uh, we described a, comp a composable platform as one in which you can take existing resources in that system and use those as building blocks to build new higher order applications. We then uh, visualized those building blocks as Legos, and we posited that the best in class next generation crypto apps would basically be built as crypto castles. Over the last year, we've been looking at a bunch of these new crypto castles uh, and these new consumer apps, and we've started to see a bunch of really interesting new design patterns and trends across them, uh, and we've started to kind of develop some really interesting new insights. If you went back about 10 years or so and looked in the early days of mobile, there were a bunch of really interesting analogs to where we are with crypto today. We think the most important is that if you could identify some of these early leading edge design patterns in these systems, you could extrapolate those uh, from one or two applications into dozens and identify new paradigms and how to think about business models and value accrual in internet systems. The most high profile example of this was really Uber and the gig economy more broadly. Uber launched in 2010 um, and was predicated on the idea that riders and drivers both had phones and that you could connect those people in real time for a basic supply demand function. Uh, if you understood that that was the basic unlock, was just supply and demand over smartphone, you could extrapolate that trend into a lot of other verticals um, and understand the gig economy more broadly. The gig economy term really took off in 13 or 14, and so you had a several year window in there in which if you understood that, that those were some of the best investments that you could have made in the last decade. Where Uber was in the 2010s, we think in terms of kind of the design patterns emerging, we think roughly is where crypto consumer is now. These leading edge design patterns we see, we believe are gonna be harbingers of uh, up and coming paradigm changes in these business models. We think these, identifying these paradigms will help make us better investors, and we're highlighting them today because we also want entrepreneurs all over the world to see them, understand them, and then build them more quickly into their applications and build out these superpowers faster than before. So I'm gonna highlight three of these leading edge design patterns. The first will be enabling arbitrary bi-directional value flow on websites and mobile apps. The second will be the growth of credibly neutral backends. And the third will be the rise of community-owned IP. So let's get started with arbitrary bi-directional value flow. What exactly does that mean? Well, today, if you go to a website, it's fairly easy for you to send money out the door. Right? You type in your credit card number, or you can now use Apple Pay or Shopify Pay or whatever, um, and it's pretty easy. You can typically send money out the door in a few seconds. Uh, but if you want to receive money when you go to a website, it kind of sucks. You have to do the bank verification thing. You have to wait a few days for the two transfers to come for 10 cents, for 40 cents. Type in the thing. You got to do the KYC, passport, driver's license, whatever. Doing this across countries is exponentially more complicated, especially for the service providers and this whole thing. And as a result, when you go to websites today, you basically cannot receive value. Right? The, number, the ratio of websites in which you can send money out the door versus you can receive value is probably 1,000 to 1, and perhaps even higher than that. Uh, crypto, by definition, solves this problem. Right? If you have a public key, you go to a website, and you present that public key to a website operator or to another person, they can send you any arbitrary unit of value. Uh, and you don't have to think about it. You can receive equities, bonds, stocks, crypto, fungible, non-fungible tokens, whatever. It all just magically works over crypto rails. So we think there's going to be two really interesting places where you can apply uh, at least two interesting places where you can apply the use of this kind of idea set. Uh, the first is in learn to earn. There are two major learn to earn things that we think are kind of working in crypto today. Uh, the first is Coinbase Earn, uh, and the second is Rabbit Hole. Coinbase Earn is a fairly mainstream uh, product focused on educating and onboarding retail users to learn about mainstream crypto protocols. You go through a tutorial, and you take a quiz, and they, they pay you some tokens at the end. Um, Rabbit hole is a similar idea, but for more kind of advanced technical topics, things like writing subgraphs and, and writing GraphQL queries, queries. What we think is really powerful about this learn to earn model uh, is actually to think about user acquisition funnels and, and search specifically. If you go back to the, the early 90s and look at a lot of the discussions around search on the internet, uh, a lot of the discussions around the business model of search was oriented around people paying for the privilege to search. Uh, it turns out that's the wrong way to think about the problem. People want to be found, and those people will, in fact, pay for the privilege of being found. Uh, we think of education in kind of a similar fashion, uh, where the idea of paying to learn actually is kind of backwards. 
there are a lot of businesses in the world that want people to, to learn about their business, about their technology stack, about their knowledge, their history, whatever it is, and they actually are incentivized to pay people to learn about that stuff, to build the top of the funnel for, for uh, employees, contractors, whatever, customers, but you just need to educate the world about your product. Enabling large scale, simple to use micropayments for this kind of value flow, we think is gonna completely change how businesses think about user acquisition across a range of verticals. The next major use case we wanna highlight here and kind of how we think value flow is gonna change um, is around affiliate marketing. You all probably heard of affiliate marketing, it's obviously a fairly big business. Uh, affiliate marketing though is fairly concentrated. Uh, the only folks who actually make cash, receive cash payments for affiliate marketing today are people who do this at scale. There's all affiliate marketing programs and, and again, because of the onboarding uh, and friction that I highlighted a few slides ago, that process is fairly cumbersome. Affiliate marketing in crypto is a solved problem. If you look at any of the major exchanges, centralized or decentralized, they have phenomenal affiliate marketing programs. You log into your account, you get a link, you share the link, and as soon as people start signing up with that link, you start getting paid immediately in either cash or in tokens. Um, these pro programs work super effectively, they're very easy to implement, and we think this is gonna become a lot more a common design pattern uh, across the internet. I wanna contrast this with a really high profile consumer product. A lot of y'all have probably heard of Athletic Greens, they advertise on a lot of podcasts and stuff. I'm a big fan of Athletic Greens, I'm a customer, I drink it most days. And they email me all the time and they say, hey Kyle, if you refer a friend, you can get 15% off your next order. The reason they do that and they don't give me cash is because of through the friction I identified a few slides ago. We think it's gonna completely change consumer psychology for uh, consumer brands when they can tell their customers, here is $10 cash for referring your friend. And you don't have to do a minimum of 100 customers or 1,000 customers, but you do only have to have two customers and you can get 10 or $20 instead of 1,000. This, I think, is particularly interesting to highlight in looking at the most regulated industry, really, in the world, which is financial services. The only industry that actually does this correctly is the most regulated one, and that's because, obviously, financial services companies already have your bank account information. They have their money transmitters. They can do all that stuff. It's endemic to what they do. Um, and this is why PayPal famously was able to offer $10 every time you sign up for an account, or why JP Morgan will pay you $500 for signing up for a credit card and spending money with them. The contrast between Athletic Greens as like a cutting edge consumer brand and then regulated financial services and that they actually do affiliate marketing kind of backwards, we think highlights the discrepancy of, of the opportunity here and what's gonna be a really amazing way to rethink affiliate marketing all over the internet. The last thing I wanna highlight here and how we're thinking about how value flow is gonna change online is to talk about TipLink, uh, which Tushar just referenced a few minutes ago. TipLink is a new primitive uh, that we had the chance to invest in a few months ago and TipLink lets you embed a private key in a URL securely. What's so powerful about TipLink is that you can then send that URL over any application, iMessage, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, WeChat, whatever. It works over every single communication channel that's been invented, and the person that is on the receiving end doesn't need to know anything about crypto. They don't need to have had a wallet. They don't need to have a public key, nothing. When they click the link, it takes them to their browser, they can receive that crypto, they can convert it to fiat, or they can then move it to other crypto wallets. But we think this is super important because this core primitive is gonna change growth loops, it's gonna change engagement cycles for all kinds of applications that embed crypto, and it's gonna, as this design primitive becomes more common, we think it's gonna really reshape how value flows between people and between businesses online. All right, so that was leading edge design pattern number one. Next up, we're gonna get into credibly neutral backends. What is a credibly neutral backend? Um, it's a backend system that has these three properties. It needs to be permissionless, uh, meaning that anyone needs to be able to read from or write to that data structure. It needs to be trust minimized, meaning that uh, every message needs to be authenticated using a user's private key. And it needs to be censorship resistant. The implications of these systems, there's gonna be kind of two, and we'll highlight both of these here shortly. The first will be the separation of front ends and back ends. Uh, and the second will be the rise of new business models based on the fact that there will be many different front ends hooking into a common and shared back end. So what does this mean? To appreciate this, let's think about some of the major social apps of the day. The objective of every major social app uh, is basically to capture your attention. Um, the reason this is the case is that their business models are advertising. And this is obviously a well-documented fact and a lot of people complain about it. But actually, there's been a subtle shift in this entire industry in the last couple of years. Uh, what TikTok has done that's so radical is they have broken the notion of a follow graph, of an interest graph, of a social graph. 
When you open TikTok, you just get an algorithm and it just starts recommending you stuff automatically. Uh, it turns out this is actually more effective than uh, enabling users to curate their own graphs. And basically, because of the rise of TikTok, uh, fa fa Facebook, Twitter, and all of the other major services have started following the same trend. The CEO of Instagram, as of a few weeks ago, was talking about the fact that they need to do a better job at recommending you new content, uh, new forms of entertainment, um, rather than following your existing friends, because they understand that their core product is an entertainment product. And because of this and because of their business model, their goal is to keep you in-app watching more ads. We're going to highlight how you can unbundle this using Twitter as an example. Twitter is uh, an amazing service, and it has a part of what makes it so amazing is you have these different kind of subtexts or ecosystems within Twitter. Each of these different verticals, there's a ton of them out there. There's crypto Twitter, fin Twitter, politics Twitter, music Twitter. There's all these different kind of sub-communities within Twitter. Um, but they all share the exact same user interface. They are monetized the exact same way, which is ads. And there's basically no context-specific or ecosystem-specific features for any of these different verticals that are used within Twitter. We think that's actually fairly strange. And we think uh, by unbundling front ends from back ends, you're going to create a lot more rich user interface experiences that can have value flow embedded in them. Once you have value flow embedded in the user interface, that creates an opportunity for the front end to capture revenue to ha and have a real business. And you don't have to go to the same ad thing. So I'm going to give just a few examples of fairly obvious ways you could do that. If you own Apple stock represented on a blockchain, Apple should be able to push this ad and insert it into your feed fairly obviously. Uh, if you follow a musician and you, or you listen to them on Spotify, as you're scrolling through your feed uh, and they're going to launch a new album, you should be able to have an NFT mint drop built right into uh, that, that scrolling feed. If you are uh, a sports fan and you follow an athlete and they're talking about either a game they're about to play in or an asset that they like or whatever, or a board ape, doesn't really matter, you should be able to embed buy and sell buttons for those different functions natively in line. The design space to embed finance really intelligently in these feeds is really, robust, is really vast. Um, and I think because Twitter and Instagram and TikTok have all been so confined for so long, it's really constrained people's mental models of what is possible here. Um, this is a really, really cool design space. And we're going to be talking about this more later today with Dan Romero from Farcaster. OK, so that was the second leading design pattern. Uh, and then the third we're going to dive into is the rise of community-owned intellectual property. So these are the largest IP universes out there in the world today. You all have heard of all of these. Um, there's a lot of commonalities among these, and I'm going to highlight just a few of them. Uh, the first is that they're all crafted and controlled by a fairly small group of people. Uh, in fact, in the case of Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and Game of Thrones, there was literally one person who created the core lore of those universes. These are all very fantastical. They all break the laws of physics. Uh, turns out universes are a lot more fun and creative when you can break the laws of physics and have new biological creatures. And these IP universes are all pretty old. Uh, the newest of them is Harry Potter, which is about 25 years old. I think it's worth noting that Harry Potter was basically the last one, and it launched right before the internet basically took off. As these IP universes have grown over the last few years, uh, or last, I should say last few decades, one thing you see pretty frequently is you start seeing them produce derivative works. And those derivative works come in all kinds of shapes and flavors. People produce these derivative works. There, there's kind of two major classes of them. Then the second row, we have uh, formally endorsed derivative works. You've heard of probably most of these names. Um, and on the third row here, we have fan fiction. Uh, fan fiction is literally random people who love these universes, uh, people writing stories, making movies, uh, whatever creative outlet they want, uh, based on characters in these universes. There's probably a thousand x more fan fiction than there is core lore out there, because people love this stuff, and they write and they create. As an example of fan fiction, uh, there's a famous Harry Potter fanfic in which Harry is actually a muggle and ends up going to Hogwarts anyways and writes about his experiences observing all of the other witches and wizards, and they're breaking the laws of physics, and he's you know, bemused and confused at like the whole thing and how it works. The biggest problem, though, with all the fan fiction is basically that those people have no intellectual property right ownership of that work, and they're just doing it as a creative side hobby, as just a passion project. Um, that means they can't market it, they can't distribute it, they can't profit from it. Um, and so the real core separation between rows two and three here is that, is the concept of ownership and the ability to market and profit from those creative works. Meanwhile, if we look at the, last, at the internet over the last 20 years or so, um, we've seen the rise of remix culture, and this has been happening across a bunch of different mediums, from video games and map editors 
through social media into things like Roblox and Minecraft. Uh, and we've ended up now with the ultimate instantiation of this with TikTok. We're actually today on TikTok, the vast majority of content that goes viral is remix content. Um, no longer is it the case that the content that is the most widely seen is original. It is now actually predominantly remix content. Uh, what does this mean for IP universes? Well, if you put these ideas together, what we've kind of concluded is that the next generation of IP universes are going to be explicitly designed to be maximally remixed. If you think about this, this has implications in everything in the design of that universe, the nature of the characters, the, the types of clans they come from, uh, how these characters and stories should evolve, what should and should not be controlled by the core creative team, what should be outsourced. It just completely changes how to think about the nature of an IP system. There's a bunch of user-owned IP universes out there. Um, they've been in various forms, and they kind of started in crypto in 2016. The first version were the rare Pepe frogs on the Bitcoin blockchain. For any of you OGs who remember those. Next kind of iteration was CryptoPunks in 2017. Neither of those really took off in a meaningful way for all kinds of historical and idiosyncratic reasons. But starting about 18 months ago, um, these user-owned IP universes started to become a thing. Board Apes was the first and is definitely now the biggest. Um, and it has kind of uh, ushered this huge new wave of people exploring new ways to build these IP universes. We're not going to get into describing each of these and what they all do. That would take too much time. But uh, I do want to highlight Loot in particular, because Loot is the most decentralized of these IP universes. It's decentralized in that there's really no uh, core team that drives it. Um, there's no re central repository of financial assets that are controlled by anyone. And what we've observed is basically that the teams that have financial assets, whether that is controlled by a central team or by some sort of DAO or multisig, uh, the fact that there is a pile of money there will draw outsiders and third parties to come iterate on the core ideas and build them out because they have some expectation of an ability to profit in the future. I highlight this because I think this really uh, makes it clear that the key to making decentralized IP ownership universes work is that third parties need to expect that if they spend the time and the energy, that they can produce profit. This only works if the core IP itself, either fungible or non-fungible, is, uh, is managed on crypto rails and that it enables crypto native capital formation around that. Groups of two, 10, 50 people, whatever, they need to be able to get together and expect that if they produce something amazing, that they can profit from it. And crypto rails enable you to do that. Over the next few years, we expect a lot of the leading minds around the world in creative works to embrace these ideas uh, and to really methodically design IP universes that take advantage of this new way to think about ownership and about remixing in distribution and presentation of these ideas. If done correctly, we think a universe like this will ultimately become larger than Star Wars because if you have a million people or 10 million people who are building these cool new creative derivatives of these core lore, that's going to just become wildly more well-known, understood, uh, identifiable for people all over the world than anything like Star Wars or Harry Potter, which are inherently closed systems. That concludes our presentation. Uh, to recap, there's a bunch of really cool new design patterns we're seeing across the crypto ecosystem. Uh, we think these design patterns are really going to change uh, business models in all kinds of industries. Uh, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at the Multicoin Summit. Thank you all.